Well, good morning. Good morning. And um, it's an exciting moment. We're going to study the scripture together. Isn't that exciting? It's like sitting down to a meal, a nice meal, and having something good. We're in John chapter 4, as we read this morning, and everyone likes to call this story the woman at the well. So that's how we know the story. We don't know her name. Don't you wish you knew her name? I kind of wonder who she was called. But for us, she's called the woman at the well. And since I'm scheduled for sharing next week, maybe we'll get through this all today. Maybe we'll get through it in two weeks, but we'll see how far we get. Let's pray together before we start. Jesus, thank you for the story of the woman at the well. Thank you for John, who recorded it. Thank you for the richness of the teaching that comes from it, for your example, for your glory that you showed. Thank you for all the benefit that we get when we read and meditate on this story. And we just pray that you would come visit each of us by your spirit in our heart today and encourage us and strengthen us in our faith lift us up and inspire us and edify us. We pray that you would protect and deliver us from all the works of the enemy who seeks to rob, kill, and destroy. Protect us in the name and through the blood of Jesus and let your word have free course today in our hearts and give us grace to obey those things that you show us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I've read this story again, I, I've just fallen in love with it all over again. And the thing that's kind of leaping out to me is the incredible love that Jesus had for the people of Samaria. And we'll go back and look at who those people were and how it came to pass that he met a woman from Samaria at this moment. But just to review, we've been starting through the book of John together. And John is known as the Apostle John. And there's another John called John the Baptist. And... The Apostle John heard the preaching and the teaching of John the Baptist, and he responded to that teaching. He, um, he, he believed what John said. He stepped out in faith. He was baptized by John. And then when John said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, John said, oh, and then he followed Jesus instead. And so John starts telling us a record of what he saw and what he heard. John the apostle has one concern. He wants to be a true and faithful witness. He wants to accurately tell us what he saw Jesus do, what he heard Jesus say. And so he's doing that. And we've started through the stories, and we started with a wonderful story of the Cana of Galilee. He saw Jesus turn water into wine and do a miracle. And then he saw Jesus go into the temple in Jerusalem and cause a big scene. Jesus took a, a, a whip that he had made, and he drove the money changers and the and all the livestock sellers out of the temple. And this was kind of a surprise to John. He'd never seen such a thing before. And then we had the story of him going off at night in secret to meet with one of the religious leaders, Nicodemus, and talk to him. And now, today, Jesus is again doing some strange and interesting things. And John is watching all this happen. And he's encountering things that he doesn't understand. He's seeing Jesus do things that aren't in line with his assumptions about what's true and what's right. And, and so John is having this experience of Jesus revealing God's heart to him. And it's, it's not all that John had necessarily imagined it would be. The love of God was revealed in Jesus being angry and cleansing the temple because those things didn't belong there. And the love of God was revealed in him meeting with Nicodemus and encouraging his face. And now, today, the love of God is revealed in Jesus reaching out to the Samaritan woman. And as we read this morning, she was confused. She said, why are you asking me for a drink when I'm a woman, for one thing, and I'm a Samaritan, for another thing? So, we'll look into that in a minute. But in order to understand the 
divide between the Jews and the Samaritans, we have to go back to the history of the Old Testament. And this divide, it's kind of like, have you ever heard about the the feuding families in the Appalachian Mountains, and, you know, and the, the, they, they have all these stories about, you know, these two families and their feuds go way back. Well, this is one of those feuds that goes way back. So, and the yeah, the Hatfields and the McCoys, maybe. <laughs> um, I want to give you children a little quick uh, geography lesson about Israel. So, how many of you have hands? Hold up your hands if you have hands. Okay. Now, in Israel, if you look at the map, way up at the top, reach up as high as you can, and make a little round circle. That's the Sea of Galilee, okay? Way up here is the Sea of Galilee. And then, can you make a fishy move like this? So we have Sea of Galilee. Can you say it with me? Sea of Galilee. And then what? No, Jordan River. So we see a Galilee, Jordan River, and down at the bottom, what do we have? A big, long Dead Sea. It kind of looks like a kidney, maybe, you know. Okay, so let's try it again. Way up at the top, say it together. Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea. Okay, this area up here around the Sea of Galilee was called Galilee. So if you lived up in that area around that sea, that was called Galilee. So when you read Jesus is going to Galilee, he's going to the area around that sea. Then down at the bottom, where the Dead Sea is, Jerusalem is down closer to there. And that area was called Judea. And between Galilee, which is around the Sea of Galilee, and Judea, which is down around the Dead Sea and Jerusalem, in between there was a region, and that region was called Samaria. It was not just a city. Samaria was the name of a city. But the whole area came to be called Samaria because of the city that was there. So let's go back and figure out when did this city start. And if we go to 1 Kings 16, it tells us exactly when the city of Samaria started, which is interesting because not all the cities in the Bible does it tell us how they began. But if we go to 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 24, it tells us about a man and his name was Omri. Can you say Omri? Who can say Omri? Omri, Omri okay. Omri became a king. And in verse 24 it says, He bought the hill Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver and built on the hill and called the name of the city which he built after the name of Shemer, the owner of the hill, Samaria. So a lot gets lost in our translation from Hebrew to English and all this, but Shemer doesn't sound a lot like Samaria, but they're related, okay? So the man who owned the hill was named Sh Sh Shemer. And then Omri bought the hill, built a city, called the name of the city Samaria after the name of Shemer. So back in those days, they would often name cities after the people who founded them. It happens between the time Omri buys the hill and builds the city and 2 Kings chapter 17. But the children of Israel, Shalmaneser. Who can say Shalmaneser? Shalmaneser. Shalmaneser. Kind of sounds like Salamander or something, right? But Shalmaneser was the king of Syria and he came and made Hosea, the king of Israel, give him money. He says, if you don't give me money, I'll beat you up. I'll beat all your people up. So he would give him money. But then Hosea decided he was going to stop giving money to King Shalmaneser of Assyria. So the king came down to beat him up. All right. And so we're in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 5. Then the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land and went to Sh Samaria and besieged it three years. So Samaria had become the capital of Israel during that time. And so Shalmaneser took over the city and took away the king. And in verse 6, in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Hala and in Haber by the river of Gozen and in the cities of the Medes. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. 
All right, and it goes on to describe at length all the details of their idolatry and how they would not listen. So, verse 18, Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight, and there was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Verse 23, until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants the prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land into Assyria unto this day. So what happened? The northern tribes, the ten northern tribes, were taken away and placed in other cities. But then the, the northern kingdom was empty. Okay. How many of you children have heard stories about lions from the Bible? Scary stories about lions. What famous story in the Bible talks about lions? Daniel, did, did he get thrown in the lion's den? And did the lions eat him? No, God shut their mouths. He sent an angel. Uh, then what happened? Daniel got taken out and who got thrown in? All the bad guys, right? And well, did you know the rest of 2 Kings chapter 17 has a lion story? You can get your mom and dad to read it to you. Say, read me the lion's story from 2 Kings chapter 17. We're not going to read it now, but there's a story about lions in there. So, what God did was, he judged and punished the children of the northern ten tribes by taking them out of their homeland, and he filled their homeland with other people who were from other places. The people from other places had their own gods. Many different gods. And so... The people who inhabited Samaria were not Jews. And there were a few straggler Jews left in the area. The king didn't haul them all away. And they began to live with these foreign people. They began to intermarry. And they began to worship the gods of these foreigners that came. And it talks about all their different gods later in this chapter. So this was the beginning of the people that were called the Samaritans that Jesus is talking to this lady she's one of the descendants of these people called the Samaritans and the Samaritans uh, they built a temple in a place called Mount Gerizim and they worshiped God there and they worshiped these false gods so the religious division started here with the mixture of worshiping of Jehovah and worshiping of false gods. The genetic demographic division started here where these people were no longer truly pure-blooded Jews. They were mixed with other tribes and other nations. And so there sprang up what we would call today prejudice between the Jews and between the Samaritans. Now, in your Bible, if you turn to the book of Malachi and you go to your last page and then you hold that page and you go over to the first page in Matthew between Malachi and Matthew there's about 400 years which the Bible our Bible doesn't have any records now you can look up records in the Apocrypha called the Maccabees and other historical documents and find out a little bit more what happened between Malachi and Matthew about 400 years well during this time the Jews and the Samaritans continued to fight. They continued to provoke each other. They continued to do things that increased the feud and the struggle between the two nations. Um, there was much warfare. There was fighting. The Greek, Rome, the Greek Empire came. Then the Greek Empire failed. Then the Roman Empire came. And by the time of Jesus... There had been all these offenses committed by the Jews toward the Samaritans, the Samaritans toward the Jews. Uh, when the Romans would come, uh, the Jews would rebel, but the Samaritans would submit. So they had political enmity between them. So by the time of Jesus, and we get to John chapter 4, when, when she says, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans, that was a major statement. There was huge prejudice. What is he doing? <laughs> Why is he talking to this woman? If you go in the rest of the scriptures and you look at references to Samaritans, Jesus is exalting and elevating 
the Samaritans by the way he treats them. This story is in your Bible. Uh, how many of you know another story about a Samaritan? Is there another Bible story about a Samaritan? What's it called? The Good Samaritan. What did he do? He took care of the man that was robbed and beaten, right? And that story is very famous. How about the story of the ten lepers? The ten lepers, Jesus healed the ten lepers and one came back to say thank you. And who was he? He was a Samaritan. So the Gospel of John and the, and the New Testament is highlighting the relationship of God with the Samaritans. God loved the Samaritans. He wanted them to have the gospel. He wanted them to have the truth. He wanted them to be saved. And he sent Jesus to speak to this woman who's a nobody. Nobody, even in her own town, she doesn't have a very good reputation. Back then, marriage was a very strict institution. People didn't break that very readily, very easily. And especially in these um, ancient uh, close-knit communities. And so for her to have had five husbands and then be living with a new partner who Jesus said was not her husband was a very big thing. And so she would have not only been despised by the Jews, she probably was not looked upon very highly by her own people. And so... Jesus is making a big statement by his actions that the Samaritans are not worthless and they're to be loved and they're to be cared for as people. So we're going to start. Woman, what have I to do with you? My time has not yet come. It se seemed kind of rude almost, right? And Jesus was saying there is a perfect time for my glory to be revealed, for, my, for the fact that I'm the Messiah to be revealed to the nation, there is a perfect time for that and the time hasn't come. And he's saying we don't want to get, you know, the horse, the cart before the horse here. We, everything has to happen in its perfect time. There was a day on which God had ordained for Jesus at the time that God wanted it to. So when he realized the Pharisees knew that he was making and, and baptizing more disciples than John, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. Now, it says here that Jesus was not baptizing them himself, but his disciples were doing the baptism. So if anybody wanted to follow Jesus, they would be baptized by one of the, one of the disciples. And Jesus was gathering a large following. Remember what it said about John the Baptist. How many people went out to see John the Baptist? It talks about in all Judea went out to see John and hear him preach. Because they hadn't had a prophet in 400 years. And had said, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. The disciples were starting out with John and then they were migrating over to Jesus. And they were giving their the attention to Jesus. So John was diminishing and Jesus was increasing and the numbers of disciples. And this baptism was something that had been taking place for a long time before John, before Jesus. It was a way, it was a custom back then. If somebody wanted to follow a teacher, they would be baptized by that teacher and they would begin to discipline their mind by the teachings of that teacher and, and try to become like their teacher. So this was the method that Jesus chose to lead his people is through discipleship and through being their teacher and setting an example and letting them follow and watch. So what's happening today in the city of Sychar with this woman, Jesus is allowing his disciples to watch him relate to people and share the gospel with them. So he comes to this, he's not in the city of Samaria. He's in a city near Samaria, which um, it wouldn't ju just have loved to have been there. Here is this plain, ordinary stone well. And it says, Jesus, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. It says, Jesus, being wearied with his journey. The Bible says that Jesus took on our nature, our human nature. That he was made in the fashion of a man and humbled himself. It says that he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. It says that he is able to feel our infirmities and he was able to be tired and 
It does not say in this passage plainly that Jesus was fasting. But I suspect that he was fasting. And especially at this moment, he, the Bible says that the disciples of John fasted, but the disciples of Jesus didn't. And Jesus uh, was not encouraging his disciples to do a lot of fasting, but he himself was fasting. And if you look at the spiritual significance of the city of Samaria, all the evil and deception and wickedness that had gone on in that city over the generations, it was very appropriate for Jesus to be fasting when he entered into this area to preach the gospel. He's, he's getting ready to upset the apple carts of a lot of people in Samaria. In a few years, Jesus will die, he will be buried, he'll rise again, he'll go to heaven, and his disciples will go to Samaria and share the gospel where it will be received. So Jesus is, so Jesus is tired and he's thirsty, and the, there comes a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus says to her, please give me a drink. Now his, um, his, his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So the story is told in the sense that Jesus and the woman are alone here at the well. Now, how did John get all this information to write in this story? Well, he must have learned it from the woman or from Jesus while she was pulling up the water and offering it to him and he was having a drink. And I, I suspect that she did, but it doesn't say for sure. And Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that said to you, give me to drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. Now, uh, this story is um, about something spiritual. And Jesus is using that here. He's, he's got her attention. She's very interested in hearing what he has to say because She's asking him a question, why, why are you talking to me? You, don't, you guys don't have any dealings with us. And so he says, well, if you knew who, talks, who it was that was talking with you, you would have asked and he would give you living water. The woman said to him, verse 11, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence hast thou that living water? He said, where can you get living water? You're, you're here. You don't have anything to get the water out. And the well is deep. And you're asking me for a drink. Where are you going to get living water? And then she asked him another question. Are you greater than our father Jacob? And Jesus never answers that question directly. He passes over that question. He gets to that eventually when he tells her that he's the Messiah, I suppose. But she's like, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank here himself and his children and his cattle? Think about the story of Jacob. Who remembers the story when Jacob wrestled with the angel? And Jacob refers to that, what they called angel, as the Lord. And so here we have this lady asking Jesus, who probably wrestled with Jacob, whether he's greater than Jacob or not. So, and, and, and it's today, believe it or not, there are still a few Samaritans left over in the land of Israel. I think, according to the article I was looking at this morning in Wikipedia, less than a thousand that still claim to be and have been shown genetically to be the descendants of Samaritans. And they still keep up their faith, and they still have their little church, and their custom, and their rituals. I haven't looked into it very greatly, but this lady is claiming Jacob as her ancestor. And Jesus, verse 13, says to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst, but the water I give him will be in him a well of water springing up to everlasting life. So what is Jesus saying here? Jesus is claiming to be living water. And one of the interesting things you'll note about John, as you go through the Gospels of John, it's a little different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
He gives you these little pictures where Jesus says, I am. He gives you these I am statements. Jesus says, I am the door. He says, I am the bread of life. And here we have Jesus portraying himself as this living water. So the woman says to him, she's still thinking in the natural. Well, sir, give me this water so I don't have to come back here and draw water. She said, that'd be really cool. If I had this living water and I take one drink and I'm never thirsty the rest of my life, it's a lot of work coming to this well and putting my, she said the well is deep, right? So she has to let it down deep and then it's heavy and she has to pull it back up and it's hot and she has to carry it home and then she has to do it again the next day. You know, I had the opportunity of living in a country where people do this, in the land of Mongolia. Most of the people are poor and they live in close proximity to places that have water, either a spring or a stream. In the city, they have wells. And people do exactly what this lady did to get her water. So every day, little children are assigned the job, go get us some water, we don't have any more water. So every day, you see little children have all kinds of types of buckets and pails and, and jugs and cans to go get water. And uh, they, they, they like to take large amounts, so most of them have these little carts. Every kind of cart you could ever think of with little wheels and big wheels and flat wheels and air wheels and, you know, it, everybody's got something. And the little kids are dragging this cart down to the well and they fill up their jugs and they drag it back home. And I, I used to really just tell myself lots of things when I saw that. Like, life is too short to be hauling water. Uh, that's what electric pumps and pipe are for. You know, uh, why are we still doing this in the 21st century? Why are we hauling water from the well? And, and I kind of devalued that whole thing. Don't want to don't wanna do that. I don't want to be a part of that. I, that's the last thing on earth I want to do is drag some water home from a well. But then I began to see other things happen at the well. It was a connecting point for people. So they'd go down to the well and they'd be filling up and they'd be talking, right? Oh, did you hear uncle so-and-so had a heart attack? Oh, did you hear who got kicked out of school? Did you hear who lost their cow and whose horse ran away? And, and there was all this community connection happening at the well because people could, could not avoid meeting. They had to have water. So they went to the well. And um, after that I began to look at it a little differently. Okay, well maybe there is space in life for people to go to a well and draw water. Maybe there is some, some good that could come from that if you're having some community connection and you're talking and, and that's what would happen. And this woman is having one of them. And Jesus says to her, you told the truth there. That's right, you have no husband. He says, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and he whom you now have is not your husband. In that, you said truly. So Jesus speaks into her life something that he could not have known as a natural man. And she realizes, oh, this is not an ordinary person I'm talking to. There was no way in the context that Jesus could have had that information. So how did Jesus have that information? Did he have that information because he was God and he knew everything? Or did he have that information by the Holy Spirit who gave him a word of knowledge so that he had that information and was able to see and perceive into that woman's life for that moment? And this is when she goes back, to, she runs back to the city and tells the men of the city what happened. She says, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. <laughs> well. I don't know that Jesus told her everything she, she ever did, but I guess if she had married and had a husband and their relationship was in crisis and she departed from that husband and had another and you string all five in line and now she's with the sixth man who's not her husband, I guess he did kind of tell her everything she ever did. Because um, that was her life, <laughs> having a husband and leaving and getting another one and leaving. And so um, Jesus didn't have to get into the details. But she says, I perceive that you are a prophet. She realizes that she's not dealing with an ordinary person. And then you notice that all the way through here, she's asking him questions. Why are you talking to me? 
well, how are you going to get the water? Because it's deep and you don't have anything. Uh, can you give me this water? And so, when she, she's a pretty smart woman. She, she's pretty um, quick-minded. And as soon as she perceives that he's a prophet, she's like, I know, I'll find out if you're a prophet or not. I'll ask you a hard question. Everybody in our community says we should worship this, um, this, this chapter. You could mine out all kinds of riches from this on many different aspects and perspectives and levels. But um, this was one of the key questions between the Jews and the Samaritans. And it started way back in the Old Testament where we read about you remember those two guys that had the funny names Jeroboam and Rehoboam? Can you say Jeroboam and Rehoboam? Well, Jeroboam was who? Solomon's son, right? And Solomon had taxed them after a while. They're all going to go back. So he decided, we'll start a new religion. I'm going to make two calves. I'm going to put one in Dan and one in Beersheba, the north and south of my kingdom. You guys can go there to worship. You don't have to go back to Jerusalem anymore. And that's what Jeroboam did and caused the nation to sin and abandon the worship of God in Jerusalem. We want to go back and see just a little bit where did this idea that the Jews had to worship in Jerusalem come from? Because this was a strong teaching. And if we go back to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 12, we'll find the beginning of this concept that there would be a place, one place, a right place to worship God. So Deuteronomy chapter 12 is Moses giving instructions to the people. He's, he's telling them how they are supposed to love how they're supposed to serve God when they come into the land of Canaan. They're supposed to, number one, destroy all the nations before them, destroy all their gods, not worship any of them. They're supposed to break down their altars and their high places and, and dwell in the land which the Lord your God gives you to inherit. And when he gives you rest from all your enemies round about so that you dwell safely, then there will be a place which the Lord your God will choose to cause his name to dwell there. So this is Moses prophesying to the people. You're going to go into the land of Canaan. You're going to cross the Jordan. You're going to fight. You're going to win. You're going to conquer your enemies. And after you've finished all your fighting and you've settled down and things are safe and there's peace, God will pick a place. And you must go to that place to bring your offerings and to worship God. And so as we read the rest of the story, we know that place was Jerusalem. And that place was the temple that was built in the city of Jerusalem. It, it repeats this often throughout this chapter, verse 14. But in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings and shall do all that I command you. Verse 17, it says, You may not eat within your gates the tithe of your corn or wine or oil or firstlings of your herd or of your flock or any vows which you vow. But you, Verse 18, But you must eat them before the Lord your God in the place which the Lord your God will choose. So this is repeated throughout this chapter even more in, in, and further on. And so the Jews had this command from Moses that they were supposed to worship and bring all their offerings to this place in Jerusalem. And this was the controversy that the woman at the well was bringing up with Jesus. She's like, you guys say Jerusalem is the place where people should worship. But our fathers, they worshiped in this mountain. And she's challenging Jesus with this question. Time coming, it's very close, when everything that was passed, you guys worshiping in your mountain and your temple, us worshiping in Jerusalem, all that, is going to be over. There was a season when that was right, and that was what God wanted, that, pe that the Jews should worship in Jerusalem. But that season is ending. There's a new season coming. He says, the hour comes. And then he says to her, you worship what you don't know. 
So remember, if you go back to 2 Kings chapter 17 and you read the names and the lists of all the gods that the, that the new tribes that came in by King Assyria's campaign, they worshipped. Jesus said, you don't have a clue what you're worshipping. But he says, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Now this is a very interesting concept here. That for every other nation of the world, Christianity is a foreign religion. And it was interesting in Mongolia, this was one of the criticisms that was often brought up by Mongolians who were anti-Christian. They said, well, that's a foreign religion. Our ancient religion is shamanism. We should go back to that, not a foreign religion. In other words, as if something foreign is inferior. And I would say to myself, well, your cell phone that you have in your hand is foreign. Why don't you reject that? And your clothes that you're wearing are foreign. And why don't you reject that? And your car is from Germany. Why don't you reject that? If everything foreign is bad, then you have to get rid of everything you have because it's all foreign because almost nothing is made or produced in Mongolia. And, uh, but this was a very strong argument. But you know, they were right. Christianity is a foreign religion. It came from where? It came from the Jews. And God raised up Abraham and his descendants to be the uh, tribal group, the people group through which the Messiah would come. He gave them uh, a relationship with himself. He gave them the rebel and our salvation. So he's saying we know place on planet earth anymore to worship God. Now can you imagine if Jesus had not changed that? if Jerusalem was still the place that we all had to go to worship. Can you imagine how complex that would be? That how many people are there in the world now? Over 7 billion, right? And some people calculate that probably maybe close to 2 billion name the name of Christ, call themselves Christians in some form or another. Can you imagine all those people trying to get into Jerusalem, that tiny little city with its few roads and its... Um, crowded little streets and, and if we all were going back to Jerusalem every time we wanted to worship God, that would be really, really tough, right? Have to spend a lot of money. You'd have to buy a plane ticket and fly over there every time you wanted to worship God. That, that wouldn't be very convenient, would it? But Jesus is saying a new day is coming where God is not going to ask you to travel to Jerusalem to worship God. You're going to be able to worship God any time, anywhere you are on planet earth. Because it says in verse 24, God is a spirit. You can have this instant communion between yourself and God because God is a spirit. God is God in spirit and in truth. This is an amazing passage. I love this passage. I love the liberty that God granted to all of his followers to have this instant ongoing perpetual connection with God through our spirit. Our spirit communicating with God's spirit. Well, this is a little much for the woman. She's, she's out of her league. She's not used to thinking and talking in these spiritual terms. She doesn't really quite get what Jesus is saying. It's kind of going over her head. And she, so what does she say? She says, well, I know when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us everything. She, she can't agree or disagree with not very many places in the Gospels where Jesus, not very many places in the Gospels where Jesus plainly says to somebody, I'm the Messiah, okay? Almost none. And um, if you can find more, let me know. I think there's one other when, he's, when he heals um, the man and he goes back to the temple and finds him and he tells him, you know, I'm the Messiah. Um, Jesus was the Messiah. He knew he was the Messiah, but he didn't go around and saying, hey, 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 hi, who are you? Uh, did you know I'm the Messiah? And uh, hey, I'm the Messiah over here. Look, look, I'm the Messiah. He, there's nothing of that in all the Gospels. Jesus was disciples come back and they've got the food and they're hungry and they want to eat, okay? Now, I don't know if you've ever led a pack of 12 men and they've been going hard and they got the food and what's on their mind when they get back? Eat, right? The french fries are getting cold. <laughs> there is no... Uh, Jesus is having this deep conversation winning this woman to, the Lord, to God and that, that's not registering on their radar. They're like... But they come back with the food and they're like, 
He's talking to a woman. He's talking to a Samaritan woman. But nobody said to him, what do you seek or why do you talk with her? Then the woman, woman leaves and she goes into the city with her, without her water pot. She left her water pot. And she went to the city and said to the men, do, did the slide go that far? There you go. Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is this not the Messiah? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples, his disciples said to him, Master, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples are looking at each other. Did you, did you, did you leave him? I mean, where, where did he get it? How, how, I thought we didn't have any food. <laughs> anyway, he has them just as confused as he had the woman. And, um, and he says to them, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So I think we can read into this, read between the lines. Jesus probably was fasting up until that point and he wanted to finish his assignment with this woman. Maybe before he ate. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump down to verse 39. Many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him because of the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did. Now, I don't know if you could imagine, if you and I are capable of imagining, what that would have been like back in that day to have somebody come and say, hey, guess what? We found the Messiah. The Messiah had been prophesied for thousands of years. Everybody was anticipating him. The Jews were anticipating him. The Samaritans apparently were anticipating him too because the woman, she says, well, I know the Messiah comes and when he comes, he'll tell us everything. So the Jews and the Samaritans both were anticipating the Messiah. But would that be an easy thing to believe if somebody showed up at your house and just said, hey, guess what? We found the Messiah. Oh, sure you did. Like that one that came a couple years ago and got killed by the Romans and the one before him that came and got killed by the Romans. And, you know, there had been many people that had come and said, I'm the Messiah, follow me, and raise an army and try to kick out the Romans and be destroyed. And so this was not a little thing for this woman to say. And as we said, she probably doesn't have much of a voice in this town. There's probably not that many people that listen to what she has to say. And so she comes and tells them, and they believe. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. Look at the love that Jesus had for these people of Samaria. The people that the Jews despised, they couldn't get along with, they had this long-standing feud, and Jesus is showing his disciples, not only am I going to speak to the woman, I'm going to go in their city and I'm going to stay with them for two days. I'm going to live in their houses, I'm going to eat and drink food with them. And so, uh, this was a shocking thing. John is writing his story. He's writing his account. So Jesus makes water into wine, and then he kicks the people out of the temple, and then he does this weird thing, and he goes and stays with the Samaritans for two days. And you know, all of this is strange and unusual, and very outside of what John could have imagined his life with Jesus could have been like. But I want to point out as we bring things to a close this morning. <clears throat> God's love for the Samaritans was very great, even though the Jews didn't have any for them. And it took a while for this to sink in to the disciples. But the story of the Good Samaritan was not lost on them. Uh, they saw, out of ten people that were healed of leprosy, a Samaritan come back to give thanks. And then when Jesus tells them to share the gospel, what does he say? If you go to Acts chapter 1, what would we want to go to Samaria for? Well, that's before uttermost area, and he set the example. He, he talked to the woman at the well. He went into their city. Verse 1, Saul was consenting to Stephen's death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. So most of the Christians were in the city of Jerusalem. They were persecuted, and what happened? They got scattered. And they were all scattered abroad throughout 
the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, okay? So God had a plan. I've got all these seeds in one basket in Jerusalem, and they're not being sown. I need to scatter them out onto the ground, the good ground. I need to get them out of Jerusalem and spread them abroad. It was like little sparks. I need these sparks to go everywhere and start fires everywhere. And so this was ordained. Of, now Philip is in the city of Samaria, this ancient city with all of its thousands of years of deception and delusion and false teaching and mis and confusion about who God. You got Abraham mixed in there and Jacob, but they're worshiping these weird gods and it's all a mess. And God is saying it's time to go and preach them the truth. So Philip went down to preach. Can you imagine what it was like to be a Samaritan and be in this city of darkness and deception and have the light of the great joy in that city? And then it tells this lengthy story about a sorcerer who had deceived the people there. Look at the spiritual bondage that was functioning in that city. That this one man could deceive all those people pretending to be some great person. And it says they had for a long time believed in his lies and he had bewitched them by his sorceries. This man who was trying to uh, get the Holy Spirit for money, and Peter had to rebuke him. Verse 14, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them and that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So God gave his seal of approval to the ministry of Philip, the work that was done, the baptisms, uh, they had the water. And if you read on into chapter Nine. Acts chapter 9 verse 31 then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit were multiplied so what is it saying here remember we had Galilee up here at the top so it's saying churches So, she said, what did she say? What did the woman say? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Who do you and I have no dealings with? That God might want us to reach out to with a gospel message. Who's that weird, strange person that has weird beliefs and you can't relate to and they're from another culture and they don't talk like you do and they don't think like you do and well this pattern that Jesus is setting here is that God calls his servants to share the gospel with people that they might not ordinarily have any dealings with and we saw this play out in the country of Mongolia for thousands of years just like the Jews and the Samaritans the Chinese and the Mongolians didn't get along with each other lots of fighting lots of killing um, lots of deception, lots of trade deals where people were tricked, lots of taking advantage of each other. And um, this has been going on for thousands of years. So when we share the gospel with the Mongolian Christians and we tell them, well, Jesus, if you want to follow Jesus, you have to love your enemies. You have to forgive your enemies. Oh, really? Yeah. And then we say, what do the Mongolians think about the Chinese? Oh, we hate them. It's like, did you ever meet a Chinese person? Oh, no, but we hate them. Well, why do, we just hate them. You know, we hate them. You know, um, that's the attitude of all the Mongols towards the Chinese. Just reflexive, automatic, drilled in, ingrained from their youth. Yes, we, we hate them. Um, when I was in China, I had a friend who was Chinese, and we would talk about the Japanese. Oh, yes, we hate them because of the Nanjing... Nanking massacre. You, you hear all the things they did to us? <laughs> and just, we, we hate them. Um, I talked to Korean people about the Japanese. Oh, we hate them. We will never have any dealings with them. We hate them. I even knew a Christian missionary pastor who had been serving the Lord for many years still hated the Japanese. Wouldn't buy an ink pen if it was made in Japan. Wouldn't buy a car if it was, wouldn't buy a cooking pot if it was made in Japan. And he eventually repented and went to Japan and ministered the gospel there with 
Japanese Christians. But every nation can have these situations where there's all this enmity between two groups. So we would take the Chinese. Uh, so this, this lesson isn't just for the Jews and the Samaritans. You're not a Jew and you don't know any Samaritans probably. But there are probably people that would be in this category for us where we would. So let's close our time together with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for giving us an example of loving others. Others that might be strange, might be different, might not be like us. But you have broken down all the walls and all the barriers between the Jews and the Gentiles, between the slave and the free, between the rich and the poor. And you said that we're all one in Jesus. So we pray, Lord, that this lesson would not be lost on us, that we would learn not to have prejudice toward any person, that we would learn to love those that are around us, that we come across in the day-to-day -day walk of life, that we would be prepared to love everyone, to give an answer, to profess to them who the Messiah is, to be bold, say to them, oh, well, the Messiah is here. So Lord, we pray that um, we would all follow your example, that we would learn from you how to be uh, taking advantage of opportunities to bring up spiritual things, spiritual conversation, and lead people to consider you and their need for salvation. We thank you for the stories that John wrote. We thank you for your work with...